Welcome to Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. Now, here's a little story I got to tell about three. You know so well. Welcome to the church of what's happening now. Welcome to the Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. This is a journey by a journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value, value, and a new experience. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ, this is Wide Awake Stories. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Wide Awake Stories. We are all together again, united in the studio. Uh, I'm Rich over here. John is uh, one half Scaramoochie to my left. Uh, Rob is about two Scaramoochies in front of me. Uh, we got Monica over there. Monica, how you doing? Scaramooch, Scaramooch. How many feet is a Scaramoochie? Uh, not many, apparently. Ten days. <laughs> it's a very small unit of measurement. Hi, Sam. How are you? Uh, I'm not too bad. <laughs> staying cool. Yeah, we're all kind of staying cool right now. Right now because it is absolutely disgusting and muggy outside in Los Angeles right now. So I'm thankful that we're in this nice air chilled studio. Same thing in New York right now. It's completely disgusting. I don't know. I don't know about the middle of the country. I hope everyone else is feeling pleasant. Number 11 is pretty stacked. John, you talked to Slender, Nightmare, and Borgor. Yeah, just based out all weekend. <laughs> the holy trinity of, of trap and bass. Yeah. Rob, you had a pretty cool talk with uh, a friend of yours, Lauren Siegel, who's involved in a really awesome cause right now. Yeah, she runs this nonprofit company called Give a Beat, and they're all about championing the power of music to help mass incarceration. And I've known them for a long time. I originally met her back in the mid 2000s when she was doing this company called Next Aid, which is the same idea. She championed the power of music to make change, but this was for green initiatives and sustainability. Um, but Give a Beat is amazing, and she's got some events coming up, and it was a great conversation. I also chatted with Nick and Jessica, two headliners that met at EDC Vegas 2011, and it completely changed their lives. So the story is coming up, and you'll hear all about how they're living their dream on a big blue bus on wheels traveling around the United States right now. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ. This is Wide Awake Stories. I've got a story I want to share with you guys. I think I want to share it with you guys anyway. I had the craziest effing dream last night. You know, usually I don't remember my dreams at all, but this one, like I woke up and I just laid there with my eyes open, looking at the ceiling going, oh my God, that was the craziest thing that ever happened to me. I'm in grade school or junior high school. I'm probably like 13 years old and I could fly. And I discovered that I could fly and I was kind of nervous showing people at first, but then I showed a friend that I could fly and they were like, oh my God, that's amazing. So I like started showing off and like flying around the neighborhoods I'd like fly up to the sky like a couple hundred feet then I'd come back down and I'd be cruising along like a car driving down the street so I'm flying down I'd come down look at the car window and then I'd fly back up and people would be clapping and then after a while people started like half the crowd was getting upset that I could fly and they were like come back down come back down you can't you shouldn't be doing this it's not right and I'd just be flying around and and if I was like 100 feet above the ground, everything was cool, like people were laughing. But then when I started getting too high, the wind started getting really bad. And then people were like, come back down, come back down. And then I'd get caught in the wind and I'd like get like sucked around and I'm like blown around randomly in the sky, like trying to fight to get back down below the wind. And then I get caught in this little turbulence up there. It was the weirdest fucking dream. I don't know what it means, but- I think we all know what the moral of that story is. What is it? Don't get too high, man. <laughs> don't fly too high. <laughs> So last weekend I went to the Good Vibration show at the Nas Event Center in San Bernardino where Nightmare and Slander headline that sold out 10,000 headliners. We caught up with Slander and Nightmare at Good Vibrations in SoCal. Try to get some exclusive info. They're almost giving you Zach the goods, but you'll, you'll see. Yo, what's up, guys? This is Nightmare. Yo, what's up, guys? This is Scott from Slander. And this is Derek from Slander. Is this tonight the biggest Good Vibration show to date? Tonight is the biggest Good Vibration show we've ever done. <laughs> and you're, we're about like an, an hour away from showtime, right? For you guys. Yeah. Yep. How you feeling? <laughs> Have you seen the crowd out there yet? Yeah, we. Um, I've been here all day. Um, I've been watching people slowly filter in. I haven't been over there in the past hour or two, but people have been saying it's pretty slammed. Yeah. 
Yeah, all of our homies who have opened up have said the crowd is already amazing, like it always is out here. But yeah, I've been kind of, I haven't even really fully gone over to the stage yet just because I want to walk up there and then when the curtain drops, have it be the big epic moment. And I was watching some of the earlier sets today and the crowd came out super early to, and they were just headbanging the whole time. It was crazy. Do you approach your Good Vibration sets differently from what you would a regular festival set or a club set? Yeah, I mean, when we play together, we try and make it totally different than when we were playing separately. And so, I mean, one of the reasons we like playing together is just because we're friends and it's just fun. And that's why we started doing it. And... You know, we have similar tastes in music, and so a lot of the songs we play overlap already, so it's just, you know, whenever I think a song is tight, Tyler, you know, 99% of this time <laughs> thinks it's tight, and vice versa, so it's just really easy for us to collaborate and, and build these sets together, and, you know, we want it to be a nice, like, cross-section of our sound and Tyler's sound, and and um, that's what makes it so special, is just because we can combine these two vibes that fit so well together. Yeah, I think that's kind of how working together came about too because like when we were in school together, we had similar tastes for pretty much everything and then that's kind of where the whole Good Vibes thing started was like when we were in music school together. So it's just developed and developed and like you said, we have a lot of overlapping tracks like between our sets so when we get to play together, it's awesome because we just get to kind of make one giant super set and like it's just super set. set. Super Saiyan mode. <laughs> Are all Good Vibrations shows B2B? Or do you ever play separately? Pretty much every single Good Vibration show has been B2B. In, like in other countries, so to speak, like Tyler would play before us or like we would play before Tyler or something like that. And we noticed that whoever had the first set got like a lot more energy out of the crowd than the person playing the second set. And so I don't know, that's kind of like where the B2B came from because that way we get to like have the full energy of the crowd from like start to finish. And I think that's kind of another special aspect of, of the B2B. You know, two hours for any crowd for them to be engaged that long is like a pretty difficult thing to do, I think, to build a set around that for anything that's like not techno or, or like more house music type of stuff. Um, so that's like what we really stri try and strive to do is maintain like a, a nice energy and like journey through a whole two hours uh, with bass music primarily. And that's, yes, yeah, so that's like part of the whole Good Vibrations experience. So walk me through Good Vibrations. You know, how did the, how did the concept come about? When did it come about? And how did it go from an idea to, uh, to become an actual realization? Yeah, it actually, I mean, just came out about super organically, which is amazing. And um, basically, you know, we did a collaboration EP with Tyler. It's called Nuclear Bonds. And um, it was both our first EP. And uh, there was a track on there called Good Vibrations. And, um, you know, we did the track. We didn't really think of all this other things. <laughs> it was kind of, we just did the song and picked the name and we did the GUD so it would have good search optimization yeah. SEO. on the song. Yeah. And um, then like a year, probably a year later after we released the song, we were going to do a collab, like a just a party. We wanted to do a party in Miami together, like our first big, like both of our first big like Miami showcase. And we were just trying to think of a name for it and... I remember I was with Tyler, he invited me on a ski trip with his dad and we were trying to brainstorm and in the cabin and he was just like, what about good vibrations? And then right when he said that, like everything just came into my brain, like <laughs> just like the party brand, melted. like the record label, like right. we're going to do in the future, like, like, uh, yeah, yeah, and everything and just the, you know, this, the saying, it just, it describes what we're all about and, and the music, it's just, it describes everything perfectly. And, um, yeah, it was just in that one moment, I just, everything came through and it just, um, yeah, it's just, the best thing about Good Vibrations is it just came about on its own. Like, it wasn't forced and it just came from our friendship. <laughs> and the fans are really eating it up, right? They're just, they're all about it. They're, they're sharing yeah. it on, on, on the hashtag, you know, I, they're here at this sold out show. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously good vibrations and like the whole rave like community vibe like goes hand in hand so what's especially one of the reasons bass music. Why? yeah exactly yeah totally 
And tonight, you're debuting the brand new Adam stage. What can fans expect tonight? I mean, one of our main goals, if we were to do another Good Vibration show after the Palladium show, was to bring back the Adam. And obviously, we want to do it bigger and better. And, you know, Jasper and Billy and the rest of the Insomniac team that were working on it had the idea of, like, making the Adam move. So, originally... It was going to be like one foot a second, which is actually pretty quick for something that big. And then I guess, I don't know, through all of the designing and stuff like that, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's more than that. It's like a transformer thing. Yeah. It's crazy. So, <laughs> um, I mean, we haven't even seen it at its like full effectiveness at, at, as of this interview right now, but, um, I mean, we've heard stories. You heard There's, this. It's, it's, it's like basically already legend and, yeah. and it hasn't even <laughs> happened yet. So I'm really excited about it. I mean, just seeing how excited Insomniac is about it is making us really excited about it. And I feel like all the teamwork and working together, that whole process is like what enables like new stage designs like this to happen, you know? And that's what we're really trying to do. If like we do a really big show, like, you know, 4,000, 5,000 people plus, like this is a part of that, of our brand now is, is having this stage and making it unique so that when people come to the show, they can expect something like completely different and completely awesome. And that's why like Excision does like the Paradox tour. And even if people have seen Excision like multiple times before they go, because basically you're watching like a HD movie of like a kitty destroying you, you know? And so this is like our version of that in a way. And we're really excited about it. Yeah, just like going up there during the daytime and like standing under it, you don't realize how big it actually is until you're like right under your like, Holy shit, this is insane. So, it's outdoor. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, they couldn't fit it under the tent, yeah, so they had to build a it separate stage for the Atom. So. Yeah, that's sweet. Is it still hard to believe that your music touches so many fans? Yeah, I mean, definitely. <laughs> I think like, yeah, I, don't, I can answer for that. Will that ever go away? Mm, definitely not. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, the meet and greet was like, we were planning on going in for like an hour and a half or something. And I mean, I, I, we, I feel like we had high expectations for the, for the whole pop-up and it surpassed them still. It was like, there was, I mean, yeah, we were there for eight hours so we could meet every person. Like there was, like, it was insane. Like after six hours, like, how is there still people? And they're like, yeah, it's like only one block long now. Right. It's like, crazy and it was so three nights yeah it was three nights we we just did the meet and greet and stuff on the first night but all three days were really great and yeah to like merch is one of those things that i've always like also wanted to like be able to do really well and like until you have a great like team doing it it's kind of a hard that you can't it's like you can do it on your own but it's it's tough and it was awesome that we were able to like link up and really just like they they killed it everybody killed it and you say you saw tattoos like good vibration tattoos you, I saw I've seen slander and nightmare tats. So I haven't seen any. I <laughs> that's, that's like next level merch. That's like the ultimate merch. Derek and I we met our first child, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Uh, it was a couple who brought their kid to the to the pop up store, and they met at our first create show in 2014. Wow! So that was uh, that was pretty awesome to see that. That's insane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's next level. <laughs> I did want to talk about Good Vibrations Radio. I was listening to it on my way over here, and I heard things that you wouldn't normally hear at your sets. You know, I heard the XX, Disclosure, some drum and bass. So is Good Vibrations Radio your uh, attempt at exposing new music to your to your fans? The radio show is just another one of our dreams come true, just because... Um, at least me and Sky, like when we first were getting into electronic music, we used to listen to like Tiesto's Club Life and State of Trance and Trance Around the World and all those shows like religiously every week and they were big parts of our lives and to get our to do our own radio show on Sirius, like it's just a dream come true to like be on the other side of that coin and be a tastemaker and say, you know, we think this is tight and we hope you guys enjoy it too and um, you know, it allows us to obviously play music that is not kill yourself dubstep, <laughs> and and that's what's cool about it. it. It shows our audience that we have this bigger expanded taste, and it allows us to do whatever we want. It's not like we only have to play this kind of music. It's like we can play any single any song we want, like. And, you know, this is our stamp of approval on it. And it, it gives us a platform to premiere our music and, like, give all these artists who are our friends, like, who don't have these platforms, like, 
a spotlight. And um, we're just really, really grateful for everyone listening every week. And it's just growing and growing, and we can't wait, you know, for next year. I think you hinted at this earlier, but your fans are probably wondering what's up with the Good Vibrations record label. Um, Can we say well, anything? Can we get the exclusive? No? Yeah, we can't say anything about it yet. We've both kind of started our own labels in order just to kind of like have the option to be able to put out music on our own, you know, like whenever we want and to be able to still have it supported on Spotify and like all the major outlets and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. yeah. TBD. TBD. <laughs> Coming soon. 20, yeah, 19. <laughs> exclusive. <laughs> Coming from an outsider perspective, I think the next logical step for us fans is a full-length Nightmare Slander album. Any exclusive info you can give us on that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how much work I'm an sure album you, takes? Yeah, yeah, I know. True, like true, true. Yeah, I just think, yeah, everything's gonna come about the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Right. So we'll start. Th- we'll start thinking about the label probably next year or so, year after, and then after that gets going. You know, maybe we'll need one more thing. (laughs) Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. You didn't get the exclusive, I didn't. Oh, that was just there. Just there. Their manager manager was peeking over, giving the the good old, like, don't say anything look. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I didn't realize they went to Icon Collective, too. Yeah, they did. And what's great about their story is that they came up together almost as a trio but they're on different paths but together at the same time and it's it's they've came they've come up the ranks through the lens of insomniac as well like every show that we book them they get booked at a bigger and better slot a bigger stage to the point where they got their own mini festival this past weekend and it's, it's awesome to see them grow so fast I haven't caught them yet, so I'm looking forward to catching them at Escape. They just dropped the lineup yesterday, and lineup both alert. of those dudes are on it. Yeah, both of them. That's sick. It's going to be a fire show. It's a fat lineup. Woo. Project Z is on the horizon for this Saturday, and John, you got to sit down with Borgor, who is on that lineup as well. Yeah, I have known Borgor for many years. I used to be his publicist back in my publicity days. Back when you were the enemy? Back when I was on the <laughs> other side, and this guy has just kind of kept going, and you can hear in his voice that he's a little bit tired because he's constantly on the road nonstop. He just announced a tour that's going to take him all over the world for over 60 days. So this guy never stops. So I popped over to his house in Hollywood the day before he he was heading on tour and he was just trying to have one last chill day in Los Angeles before losing his mind on tour. Artist Relations. So you just announced your Blasphemy tour today, like hours ago, right? And it's literally taking you around the world over... 60 dates across North America, Europe, Australia, China, basically the entire planet. I feel like you spent the majority of your career on the road. Do you ever picture a time when you're not on the road and and maybe in the studio exclusively? So for me, it's like, it's not even in the studio, it's just like being home. It's it's almost a fantasy, you know? Not as young as I used to be, but I'm still young. I still have the the option to go on the road and and do this. I should do it as long as I can, you know? I released um, a video a couple months ago called Help that is um, (laughs) exactly talking about the fact that like my dream is just to come to the point that I can just like have a huge farm full of dogs. Uh, maybe some other animals too. Just like a, a Stenway, grand piano, chill, play music, dude, and relax, you know. You said it yourself, you know, you, you're getting a little bit older. Do you feel like you still have the same stamina? Or is it getting harder to keep up with this, this hectic touring schedule? No, I'm still I'm still full on as far as stamina. This couple next week are um, probably harder bout than I've ever had in my life. So I'm still full on. I don't feel the slowdown yet. The only thing is, um, I guess I'm wiser. I know when I should stop with the alcohol. <laughs> or now I'm wearing earplugs when I DJ. Stuff that like I didn't really care when I was younger, but uh, now I pay attention to these things, you know. Do you still enjoy life on the road like you did when you were younger? Does it still feel exciting to you? I'm enjoying maybe 
in-depth things things now like you know when i was younger i only wanted to like go and party my ass out i used to just sit in the hotel and order room service now i'll go and try like local cuisine i'll go and um go to museums check art local art stuff like that although yeah dude for me partying is still a big part of enjoying tour i think do you feel like you adopt any influences from the countries and cities that you're visiting? And do you feel like you discover any new sounds or artists while you're on the road? I've learned that you have to listen to every country you go. You have to pay attention, you know, to what they like. And basically, when I started making dubstep, it was only big in like England, Belgium and Israel. And, and that sound was like interesting and new and I, I ran with it, you know. So right now when I go to a country and they have all of a sudden this genre that is really popping there, and not popping anywhere else I 100% pay attention to it go explore figure out what's going on you know but also it's really really weird traveling the world because you can be in America you know most states listen to kind of the same music but in uh, Europe you can be in two countries that are next to each other geographically like let's say California and Nevada they like completely different artists so you have to really pay attention to these things I don't know it's great to uh, go around the world and see what people listen to get new ideas get new vibes fucking love it what countries do you see right now that are popping up on the map in terms of the EDM market like any new countries that are just discovering electronic music or where electronic music is becoming popular just now for myself lately have been going to Asia more and I'm not sure if it's um, organic if the crowd really likes EDM right now or it's more like what the Chinese football league is all of a sudden they're buying all these huge players to try and make the Chinese people like football you feel me and by football I mean European soccer you know not American <laughs> football if you uh, look at the Chinese league right now they're the most paying league in the world you get more money to pay you're a top tier player right but you not necessarily better than Ronaldo <laughs> or Messi I'm not saying that there's not that this crowd doesn't like it but I feel like they're trying to bring more and more uh, bigger artists into Asia to make it pop right now what I, what I feel right now is that if you go Eastern Europe they're very much into uh, the harder bassy sound and they're also very into underground hip-hop so right now i feel like eastern europe is actually very on the same page as the united states i feel like where we kind of lost our our strengths is probably uh more to the west england used to be the biggest bass culture i don't even know what's going on there i mean i know they're really into grime probably they probably like the more commercial stuff they're not in sync with us uh, when it comes to bass music i feel like before our interview, I, I spent a lot of time looking at your social media, which to me has always been a fascinating thing. I've noticed that you have a very special and unique bond with your audience through social media. I even saw fan tattoo lyrics to your song Legend on their body. How did you go about building such a deep connection with your fans online? From day one, everything that I've done was very organic. I never went through a major label, never went through... I, I'm still not signed to anyone. So from day one, what happened, I had a MySpace, I uploaded a song, two or three people were commenting on my song, I was answering them, there was kind of like, we like this, we don't like this, I was fixing it. The next song, there was like 20, 30, and, and it kind of kept on growing, but the system stayed the same, you know? I upload a song, a picture, a post, whatever. It's it's just the same, just the, on a bigger scale. It's not a made up story, you know. It, no one built this social media in order to gain something. Everyone changes, but I, but to an extent. And I don't feel like I, you know, the fact that I'm sitting here in my really nice studio and have my more comfortable life whatever i don't think that i changed as a person i don't see myself as a big star or something and uh you know i like to still talk to the people who listen to my music and see what they're saying and what they think you know and i try to stay in touch with <laughs> as many as i can does your connection with fans ever translate from url to irl I mean, it still stays on a com on a computer screen, but I tend to uh, play video games with my fans. <laughs> it's something that, dude, I love to do. So it's kind of still on the computer screen, but yeah. Hey, yes, I gained some friends in real life from this whole thing. It's kind of hard to stay in touch with everyone because I'm always on the road. Also, what how it translates the most is a lot of people hit me up, like, let's say I'm a single mom. 
I'm a college student, I'm a whatever, whatever. And my guest lists are usually full of people that I'm helping to get into my show rather than like my like actual friends, you know. We were talking earlier about the, you know, the bass scene, which you're you're really passionate about. I can tell when, you know, listening to you talk about it. Whenever I'm at one of our festivals and I'm backstage, I sense like this strong feeling of you know camaraderie and like just homies being homies and a, a strong bond within artists specifically in bass music that i haven't really seen in any other genre like not really in like the big room edm genre or with maybe with the trans family but what do you credit this bond in bass music you know it might sound like cheesy or whatever, but you know, the fact that everyone's genuinely a producer. The other day I was in a hotel room with Gather and Sneak and uh, Faiso and Half Empty. So we were all sitting there and we were um, genuinely like passionate talking about production. And like we genuinely, all of us love video games. We're all a bunch of like geeks, produce bass music, play video games, watch the same scene. We do like to party, but it's um, it's more about our, our love to what we do rather than the making money and spraying champagne <laughs> I mean, part of stuff. You know, we, we all of us are in this together. We want to enrich each other. We want to get to a uh, glorious new places together you know it's um less about like i don't know it's it's genuine i feel that same bond also stretches from the stage into the crowd like i see like just a big community within the bass world that is almost unique to that sound and whenever we have like the bass rush stage it goes off right you have the bass rush flags the bass rush totems and it's, it's interesting to see that bond within artists spread to to the fans like what but it's 100 percent the same thing you know like you go to a main stage in a festival i would say maybe over 50 percent of the people there because they actually like the artist but a huge percentage of the people there sometimes close to like 50 percent are just there because they heard the festival is a cool thing edm is a cool thing they just come there like on the main stage no they're not sure what they're doing there you know um and and this is where they're gonna be in the bass world these kids fucking love bass music dude and they fucking they know each artist they know songs that you don't know about i play some underground shit i found on soundcloud like no you know like how the fucking did they even get to it and the whole crowd knows the song you know it's like they're really they love it so so you know we have a real bond i don't want to disappoint them speaking of bass music this month in socal you're playing our project z festival which pits together two very heavy flavors of bass music with dubstep slash trap and hardstyle slash hard dance you know you got you got your bass con family with hardstyle and your bass rush family with dubstep and bass music do you think a show like this makes sense to bass fans is this something that you saw coming or something that grew out of this bond that we're talking about i don't think it contradicts you know on uh, dubstep and trap doesn't contradict in any way hard style and hard dance right now there's this thing called hard trap which is basically hard style with trap drums and for a long time you know for a really long time trap is actually derived that's the word from hard style you know it's basically they took hard style changed the drums to hip-hop beats so it absolutely makes sense but at the same time like you go to a festival two different types of uh, bass music are um, it, it's under the same family uh, even if you put a fucking main stage there with some you know 128 stuff I see it working put a classical stage there how is that a problem maybe someone's gonna go to the bathroom accidentally through the classical stage see some crazy pianist and fall in love you know uh, in the bottom line everyone should be open minded about anything you know put a country stage maybe there's a crazy country song singer you know then, then some people will be all of a sudden you know the heart tell people will be like yo this shit's lit you know <laughs> It's music is music. People should not like, people should step out and like explore. Feel me? By the way, country is lit though, dude. You ever go to like this country music festival? They know how to party. They know how to party. <laughs> Are we ever going to see a full rap album from Borgor with you on the mic and behind the boards? My whole career was thinking about it. It's it's something that um lately have been rising a couple of times. It's something that I was thinking about doing 
a lot lately and people don't know if or some people do know i finished a jazz album in january recorded jazz album i have a jazz album ready to go as borgor and when i'm talking jazz i'm talking super complex changing rhythms complex harmonies uh, me improvising on the piano all live trio upright bass drummer crazy shit Barry, the problem is how the fuck do i release it <laughs> so i think we're gonna release it in the winter because to me jazz is a all year album you know i want to listen to jazz when it's hot when it's cold when it's whatever to my management that are not very big jazz lovers they're like oh jazz is a winter music let's release it on the winter when people are at home chilling with their hot cocoa it's not how i see it i see it dude jazz is turn up in the sun by the pool so i am doing stuff outside of uh, what people would expect and honestly the two things that i'm thinking about right now is a pop record just like in pop album i have like three or four records that are super poppy with the sound of me you know and uh and a hip-hop uh a full like uh mixtape uh that i'm rapping i have an ep called blasphemy coming out also aggressive bass music uh, that's the mainstream for me that's the main line i'm going and sometimes i go off stream with making hip-hop jazz pop big room whatever i mean it, ki- it kind of goes to what you were saying earlier of just get out there explore something new find something new that isn't just on the main stage which i personally i'm a big proponent of that too i do want to talk about your imprint by gore which has really grown throughout the years to become one of the leading independent labels in dance music. How is Bygor an extension of your vision from from day one to where you are now? The, the idea behind it was uh, pretty revolutionary. What happened is, Borgor, my first year, I had records that, that were going like millions on YouTube. I was selling out shows throughout the world, but no label would release my music, so no one could buy my music. There was no way for me to put it on any shop, dude. And the whole individual, like, uh, TuneCore stuff wasn't around. It was still in the very beginning of it. There was no Spotify. SoundCloud was not even on. Dude, Facebook was just starting, you know? So what happened is I just started my own label. And the whole concept of this label was we will go into the trenches, go on the, on the YouTubes, go on the SoundClouds, go on the fucking MySpace, whatever was re- relevant that year, and find these artists that are, you know, that they have uh, incredible new music, they are bringing something new, and release their music because the major labels only backed up stuff that they thought can go to the radio. But it was very revolutionary back then. I feel like that what we started as a, as a concept, and I'm not saying we were the only one, there was obviously there was more than just us. We were just very in the bass world, but there was people all across the border. Even in the bass world, there were like Rotten and there was circle, uh, Circus and, um, uh, and Firepower, you know, and Smog. You know, there's, there were more people like that, the more labels like that. But w- what happened is that the majors figured out our system and now they're only signing stuff that pulls numbers on SoundCloud. They won't put their hand out to anything they don't think that doesn't prove itself on social media, you know. Or they even go to like social media people Oh, you haven't popped Instagram. Let's make music to back your Instagram. So our concept, what we were built on, is what the majors are doing right now. But this is what we were unique about. But this is still what we're doing, you know? We're still going out there on the internet or, or you know, we're very close with the scene here. And a lot of uh, musicians come here because of Icon and, and the schools and the scene. And we have a lot of friends in the, in the scene here in LA. And we just pay attention to, like, the younger people with like we talked about like the pure sound like the you know i think the 95 bpm with hardcore swing and fucking fart sounds sounds great and then they write a record and it sounds and you're like shit you know this fart is lit you know and it's just like yo it's, it doesn't matter do whatever you want you know feel free to explore uh, do a song with 24 vacuum cleaners if it's good it's good you know what i mean <laughs> it's, we're not actually signing any farts or vacuum cleaners <laughs> Not yet. No one came out with it. I mean, uh, 16 Beat back in the days came out with Chainsaw Calligraphy. That was a song that just was a chainsaw the whole time. It was insane. They changed my vision about everything, you know? Um, so, yeah, I'm waiting for someone to do it with a vacuum cleaner. But right now, we're, uh, I guess, 
and it's not that our this is our focus this is just like what's cooling our eyes right now because the more popping stuff right now is um is in rhythm i guess <laughs> i call it whatever you want like that's a lot of what we're signing right now but what can you tell me about your new sub label fresh blood fresh blood is like my gore just more hardcore <laughs> it's just that's the trenches that's straight up like rhythm or you know maybe hard style or whatever or vacuum cleaning vacuum yeah vacuum house <laughs> yes so what can fans listen to before you they catch you on your blasphemy tour so this year i released a bunch of uh, heavier records uh big bad help domino all very harder dubstep sounding stuff uh, right now we have next week coming out a uh, new record called savages i guess people can say it's a big room <laughs> but it's a uh, but it's basically a four to the floor kick with a very aggressive dubstep synth call it whatever the fuck you want it doesn't really matter to me i don't follow by you know names for the blasphemy tour i'm about to release a ep called blasphemy still working on it <laughs> but uh yeah you know um the whole concept behind blasphemy is um this is the obvious meaning blasphemy which is basically i'm saying that you know y'all calling me into the tour to sin you know <laughs> basically you know it's gonna be a lot of sinning but at the same time um it's kind of like and that's the more subliminal level of things right now in israel gay people can serve in the army but they cannot adopt a kid if being gay is a blasphemy i support blasphemy you know if like some parts in the world women cannot wear whatever the fuck they want so i support blasphemy dude if getting an abortion is a blasphemy i support blasphemy dude whatever i support lo- lo- logic <laughs> you know it sounds like you're saying you support people having the ability of choice you made my life easier for the next interviews yes i support freedom of choice <laughs> yes broadcasting from the insomniac hq this is wide awake stories fun fact borgor started as a jazz artist yeah i can't wait to hear that jazz album yeah. again, right? <laughs> that's gonna be insane a borgor jazz album what yeah. the hell does that sound yeah. like i don't know we'll see you know what else i'm kind of curious him to release this fart song yeah. <laughs> fart and vacuum <laughs> tracks with- what'd you call it vacuum house <laughs> vacuum <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of life on the road, I recently hooked up with two of our headliners. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you kinky. <laughs> I recently chatted up. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, now that sounds dirty. <laughs> I recently linked up, like I said earlier, with Nick and Jessica, two headliners that met in 2011 at EDC Vegas. Their weekend was pretty damn special, and it changed their lives completely, and their story is so touching. Jessica quit her job, moved in with Nick. They traveled around the world. They came back, bought a big blue bus, fixed it up, turned it into a tiny home on wheels, and now they're just living the life. They're in Salt Lake City right now, so we jumped on Skype and we had a conversation about what they've been up to for the last couple months and how things are going. Headliner highlights. So hey, Nick and Jessica, thank you guys so much for joining us on Wide Awake Stories. I really appreciate you making the time to be here. How are you doing? We're doing fantastic. Where are you guys calling from? Where am I catching you guys right now? We are currently in Salt Lake City, Utah. Fun. Enjoying the hot weather here. So that's originally your home base? We originally are from the Bay Area, San Francisco, California. In the last five years, we've been in Lake Tahoe. We've been tinkering away on our tiny home conversion project, which is a school bus that we converted into a tiny home on wheels that we've been traveling and living full time in for a few months now. Oh, I am so jealous. I mean, this whole gypsy nomadic thing that you have going on right now sounds pretty damn amazing. And I know a lot of people, I do, wish that they could do this. And for one reason or the other, feel like you can't make it happen. It's been a few months now since you've been on the bus. I guess I want to start right before you guys actually made the move to the bus full time. And I'm curious what the whole downsize process was like. Was it hard to sell? All your belongings so we went from living in 1500 square feet a two-story duplex into 100 square feet in the bus 
So downsizing was quite a challenge. We had, you know, table settings for 12 people and now we only need table settings for two people. I had a bunch of clothes, of course. I'm a girl who loves options. I had a ton of festival clothes as well. And I was able to use the app Poshmark where you're able to sell your gently used items and or brand new items and kind of earn money that way. So instead of donating all my clothes, which I had done every other time I had moved from house to house, I was able to earn some money from this that was able to be put towards life on the road and our gas tank. I would say that I definitely had a lot of stuff, but I had a different kind of stuff. I had a lot of like toys, I've had a lot of tools and things of that nature and a lot of camera gear since I'm a professional photographer, videographer for a profession. So for me, it was a matter of figuring out which gear gets to come, which toys get to come, which activities do I take, which do I leave, or who do I give what kind of thing. A lot of the stuff I didn't necessarily want to sell, um, things like a skill saw, or microphones for my camera gear, or my gimbal, things like that, or, or my snowmobile, for example, which I wouldn't be using in the summer anyways. So for me, it was more so figuring out where I could put these things and um, asking a lot of favors from friends and family if they'd be interested in storing it and or using those items. So since you've been in, I mean, has your lifestyle changed a lot since you guys have made this move full time or how, how if at all, has it changed? Our lifestyle has changed more so in terms of we're having more activities outside. We mainly use the bus to get from location to location, of course, and then we prefer to stay outside all day, go on hikes, go on walks and do some yoga and Nick likes to mountain bike. So we're able to go out and venture off so that it doesn't feel like we're confined in a hundred square feet and we take advantage of the outdoors a lot more. And we mainly use the bus at that point just to come back, relax, prep food, go to sleep and get our work done. I think a good way to put it would be, we live outside, we sleep in the bus. Where have you guys been since you've been in the bus full time? We started off in the Bay Area, visiting my family, kind of organizing for a little bit. And then from there, we went east over to Yosemite National Park for a couple of days and then over to Mammoth Lakes and kind of made our way up June Lakes up to Lake Tahoe, which was originally our home base for a while. Um, kind of reorganized everything. From there, where did we head after that? Did we just come straight here? Straight towards Salt Lake after that one. And then our next stop is going to be Sun Valley, Idaho. How long are you in Salt Lake for? You, that's where you are right now? About 10 days. Yeah, we're in Salt Lake at this moment. <laughs> we've had quite the week. Yeah, our bus broke down, so we've been dealing with a lot of stuff. Last year, when we were heading to Salt Lake City, we had stopped at the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is a dried up lake bed that just has salt now as like it's covering. But pretty much it looks like this sandy area, but instead of sand, it's salt. So we started heading out to the Salt Flats and Nick remembered where we were the last time and we started going in that direction. So now we're on the lake bed where you're not really supposed to be driving. It's a little bit more dangerous and there was a river that you really can't see because it was covered in the salt. We ended up hitting a pothole into it. So then we needed to get a tow truck and because we're in a school bus, no truck, tow trucks really want to tow it. And since we're on the salt flats, it becomes an even bigger mess since you're in the mud. And then tow trucks, I don't want to go out that deep in the mud. And it kind of all snowballs into 30 hours in a motel room. But how far is like the closest building to where you guys are at this point? The closest building and we're like civilizations probably was like a mile, mile and a half of way. And there was no one there. <laughs> around us at this point. There was a thunder, lightning storm, and rain coming all at the time of the first attempt to get our bus out. And at that point, the manager of the tow truck company said that they no longer could continue with trying to get us out. And we had to immediately rush out of the salt flats. Keep in mind that our bus is like aluminum metal. And so we're also just like this big target for a lightning bolt to strike and lightning wasn't too far away from us. So that was kind of scary and challenging. And basically we got stuck around 5 p.m. and we didn't get onto a tow truck until like 10 30 the next day 10 30 p.m. The, PM next day. the next day oh my god so is this the first time like something major like this has happened to you guys or we had to rebuild the engine actually prior to this when nick took the bus on a trip to yosemite and that's the first time we really had some major mechanical issues with the engine and we decided that instead of investing into tow truck fees we were just going to redo the engine and have a really solid engine so that we could have avoided this type of situation in the future well now you're going to have a really strong axle as well right 
Absolutely. Correct. Yes. Um, so you're getting all the bad stuff out of the way. It's going to be blue skies from here on out. Right. So the positive side out of this, because I always try to look towards the positive end of things, even when it's a really crappy predicament sometimes. We had been living in the bus now a couple months, and I always kind of felt like, you know, there was some other home I could safely go home to. It felt almost like a vacation and that I still had my home back in Tahoe, when in reality, though, I had nothing else. I We really just have this bus. And so going through this experience, not being able to get into to our bus for 30 hours or whatever and not being able to even know if our bus is safe really made me realize that you know this is my home that's the only place I need to be and so it was um, quite a celebration when we finally hit pavement my grandfather had given me this bottle of champagne when I was 21 years old and I've been holding on to it now for 10 years waiting for a special moment and he said you know open this bottle when you graduate college or you get a first big deal or when you buy a house I don't really think I'm going to buy a house in the next, you know, handful of years. But when we hit that pavement, it felt like this was home. This is my home. This is our home. It's time to celebrate because this is where we need to be. And this is our life. And this was an accomplishment and a positive thing. Nice. Well, cheers. Thank you. So am I correct? Did you guys both leave your your full-time jobs? We're on the road full-time. Nick is able to work remotely. As long as we have internet, we both can manage our job. I technically quit my job, but after a month or so with me not being there, they had asked for me to be able to work for them independently as a contracted employee. So I'm able to do virtual assistant work for that old company. Meanwhile, take on other clients. It all pretty much comes down to is if we have internet, We can get a hold of email and we're able to continue our businesses. So if you guys decided to pick up and go to New York tomorrow, could you? Or do you have to stay geographically somewhat close? I absolutely could go anywhere. Um, And that probably is a nice lead into our winter plans this year, which is to head down to Baja, Mexico, kind of surf our our brains off and uh, and work at night. We're going to kind of transition a little bit and take a year off of the winter. How do you balance working and living in such a small space? Working and living in a small space is a difficult challenge. For myself, I tend to work in the mornings for a couple of hours, and then we will go outside generally during the midday, during the heat of the day, and then work again during the evenings when it's a little bit cooler. If we're in city settings, then we'll likely go to a coffee shop and kind of use their Wi-Fi and or air conditioning because our bus is an 88, so it's not equipped with AC. We deal with quite a bit of extreme temperatures considering that it's summertime, but our route is mainly the Pacific Northwest to kind of avoid going inland towards the desert. I'd say the most challenging, I guess, time that we usually have in the bus is every year we go to Burning Man in Black Rock City where temperatures can flare very high in the day and then go very cold at night because it's in the desert. And since that was uh, Burning Man was our first place that we really wanted to take it, I'd say we were pretty well prepared for any warm temperatures on the road uh, due to the week-long stretch out in the desert. I read on your guys' website that it's one of your missions to connect with younger people in hopes of just kind of opening their eyes to the fact that this simplicity and freedom go hand in hand that you don't need to live an extravagant lifestyle to be happy we're just trying to connect with everyone to help them realize that you know you may feel that you're trapped in this situation but there's always a way to get to get out i want to put an age i guess limit on who we're trying to connect with we just truly want to help inspire people that if you put your soul into your goals you can achieve your dreams no matter how big or tiny they may be We were raised, you know, you go to school, you get a job, you get a career, you get a house, or you get married, you get a house, you have kids. And that kind of, I guess, progressive timeline that we were told to do isn't what really made us happy at the end of the day. I went to school, I got a great job, I had a career. At one point I had some wealth or money, I guess you'd say, coming in that more than I'd ever had, you know, growing up. And that kind of gave me this sense of security, but at the same time, I was really unhappy. I wasn't really feeling satisfied or a zest for life. And with this bus, it just kind of helped give me a, a new focus and thinking that, you know, you can be happy just living simply and just just making your own path in life. You don't have to follow what society says. It's okay to go against the the norms of what you've been taught. Just follow your heart and follow what's really in your gut. 
if, as long as you believe in yourself, you're the one who's making these decisions. Everyone else may just judge you no matter what, but at the end of the day, you're the one having to wake up and face yourself in the mirror and say, am I happy today? Am I happy tomorrow? Am I on my true calling and my true path? So when did this realization happen for you? The start of the realization of this actually happened for me on my first time going to the Electric Daisy Carnival in Las Vegas in 2011. And that's where I actually met Nick. Just seeing that community, how free everyone was, how happy everyone was, how everyone could be different, but yet we all come together under this umbrella of music. I, it was really empowering. <clears throat> Sorry to get emotional. It was really empowering because <clears throat> none of my friends felt that way. And not a lot of my friends were like that. You know, we were, it was just a really special place and a very special moment in time when I was like, I don't really need all this bullshit in my life. Like, I just need myself and music and, and the community there. It, it's just, it's really special. What do your families think about what you're doing right now for the last couple months? <laughs> so my dad is an insurance agent, and um, you laugh, yeah. Jessica. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, Who? What family is going to be like? I mean, I never thought. Even if you told myself five years ago, Jessica, you're going to be living in a school bus. <laughs> Hell no, 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 no. My no. My life was like I'm going to live in a mansion and I'm going to be balling, and that the realization just made me realize like no, I don't. I don't want to be balling. Actually, I want to have more value out of experiences and value in things. My family definitely has seen this change in me, clearly. At first, you know, they're scared for us to be in a bus. They're scared that we don't have a secure home or, you know, steady income, let's say, in their mind that, you know, I'm going an eight to five job and I'm, you know, putting in my time that way. They were scared for our safety when we're parking in some of these places. They're scared for me when I'm hiking and I might be twisting my ankle or something and where's the nearest hospital and that's going to require us to research something or you know like just the unknown is what everyone's afraid of they think it's exciting now now that I've been in it for a couple months and proving to them that everything's okay mom and dad like you don't have to be freaking out I get way less text messages now from my parents asking are you okay are you home are you safe <laughs> like the perception of what we're doing is like hippie bus that's got spray paint all over the sides and flowers all over it and spray paint and tapestry and the sense of like very you know your, their perception of it is like 1960s 70s like Woodstock you know free life where in reality I mean we have a sink we have a stainless steel undermounted sink on this beautiful wood countertop and bamboo hardwood floors in here it's nice. I mean, if any of my parents showed any of their friends, they'd be extremely impressed at the craftsmanship that we've put into it, and, and the effort truly shows. So, I would say my family initially was a little freaked out. I'm sure they're still a little freaked out now, like, for example, when we break down or something like that. But overall, I mean, we're grown-ups. We have a good head on both of our shoulders. We're smart. We have good problem-solving skills, and ultimately, we're going to be just fine and have a fantastic time. So, I think both of our families now, at this point, are both very happy and excited to see where we're going to go and where this bus is going to take us. You're tuned in to Wide Awake Stories. So yeah, I can testify that working remotely is the shit. <laughs> um, I have worked for Insomniac from multiple states, from moving buses, from backstage during theatrical productions. It's amazing. So that's cool that they've worked out uh, this life where they can work wherever they go. They're very, very lucky. That is that is a blessing to be able to do that. Also, something y'all may not know about me, I lived for three years in an Airstream trailer. Really? Oh my god. Were you traveling or was it... No, it was permanently parked behind a friend's house in Northeast LA. It began as like a temporary post-breakup refuge. <laughs> not refuge, not like I was being beaten or anything, but just <laughs> a post-breakup like getaway. And then it ended up, I lived there for three years and I had running water and electricity and... I bumped my head a lot. Yeah, well, so. you're tall, yeah. <laughs> you know, my biggest takeaway, Monica, was that anybody could do this. They just have to want it bad enough, right? Like, there's no reason why Nick and Jessica could do it, and anyone listening to this show can't do it. You just got to follow your dreams and make it a reality. Rob, I, I, th I think you need to do a little dream analysis right now. <laughs> Maybe I should do a little dream analysis right now. Just um, don't let Pasquale know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know. Don't worry. <laughs> That's just one of the amazing stories that we always get. You know, if you guys have amazing stories that you want to share with us, we want to hear from you. Hit us up on the Wide Awake Hotline. That number is 
9406. You can find us on social media at insomniac.com on Facebook and the Twitters and just hashtag up at Wide Awake Stories. We'd love to hear from you. Let's get serious here for a second and talk about what Lauren is doing. Lauren Siegel is an awesome woman that I met in the mid 2000s while she was serving as the executive director for a sustainably driven nonprofit company called Next Aid. And her whole thing is she's all about championing music to help causes. And today she's running Give a Beat and she continues to harness the power of the dance music community, this time though, to shine a light on mass incarceration, which is a huge, like a ginormous problem in the United States. I mean, did you guys know we locked up more people than any other place in the world? I can believe it. I mean, some of the stats are crazy. In the last 40 years, the rate of incarceration has gone up 500% overall and 800% for women. I mean, that's insane. Like what grows 500% in 40 years? Mass incarceration in our country is just into institutionalized racism and classism. It costs us, and I mean like you, me, everyone listening, and it costs us a trillion dollars a year to keep people locked up. And while it costs us a trillion dollars a year, like the for-profit prison companies are making millions a year. So it, it just, it's astounding how much of a problem this is. And one of the other crazy facts that I learned that it costs more to lock up a juvenile for a year than it would to send them to Harvard. Think about that. So Lauren drove up to the Insomniac office with Ben Anon, who handles all the production and the event side for Give a Beat. And we had a great conversation about what they're doing and how you and I and everyone listening could help. Experience creators. Hi everyone, Rob, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Lauren Siegel and I'm the co-founder and director of Give a Beat. Hi everyone, hope everyone's having a great day. My name's Ben Anand. I am the founder of Tropical Events, which is a nonprofit event company out of Los Angeles, as well as resident DJ with the Moon Tribe Collective that had a formative uh, shaping experience on a lot of people in our dance community. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. Um, Lauren, I want to start with you. I mean, obviously giving back is the right thing to do, but why did you start Give a Beat? And what is it about mass incarceration that you felt it's so important to get involved with? Yeah, so I started Give a Beat because I was very concerned and upset of what I had discovered uh, has been going on in this country for 40, 45 years since the declaration of the war on drugs. We lock up more people than any other country on the planet. The way we treat juveniles, where we sentence them as adults, put them in solitary confinement, is just, it's basically torture. And this mass incarceration epidemic has had devastating effects, I mean, generational uh, impacts on particularly poor people and communities of color, and really everybody. When you have that much focus on, on harming certain communities, it, it impacts entire country as well as the world. I mean, even when you look at voting and how many people can't vote because they have been and locked up and how that now that is having global repercussions it is a massive problem and it's been able to kind of pretend to be about crime and pretend to be you know play on this idea of that we're going to be safer by locking people up and it's a sham it's basically been ruining people's lives you know I would say when I started to uncover what was going on my starting point was learning about wrongful incarcerations people who are straight up completely innocent if your listeners can actually take a look at this website. It's called the National Registry for Exonerations. And it documents over a thousand people who've been wrongfully accused, wrongfully incarcerated, and then later exonerated. And when you read through why these people were locked up, it's it's obscene. And these are people who you know, when they have discovered these wrongful convictions, they're the hardest core cases. I mean, there are people who are looking at life or death in prison. So those are the cases that Innocence Project and organizations like that work to get released. Imagine if that's happening to people who are facing life or death in prison, how many small charges there are, how many misdemeanor people who have been accused of misdemeanors never even did it. If you're poor, you don't get good representation by an attorney, so you have a public defender who doesn't have time to talk with you. Next thing you know, you cop a plea because you just went to easier thing to do. You'll get home faster. So people who are sitting there in jail for things that they never did, for the smallest infractions, and it's completely disrupts their life. They lose their jobs. They lose they lose their benefits. So this number that we talk about being the locking up more people than any other country in the world of 2.2 million people behind bars, that is a fraction 
of what is actually happening on a much larger scale just by having this mass incarceration for profit prison system. So yeah, felt compelled to do something about it. So with Give a Beat, I love that you're using music as inspiration and a mode of communication and definitely just a vehicle for change. And you know, I'm a huge music lover and I know music is a powerful bridge to get over any gap or any rift that you have a problem going on in your life even if you're just feeling bad on that particular day you put the right song on and it changes your mood so music is definitely a powerful tool so how does give a beat use music specifically to help this problem it's threefold i guess we first of all we have a a huge audience through music. So as far as educating people what's going on, you know, our DJs are the messengers. There's festivals, there's events, we're a community, we're all connected on the internet. If you're talking about raising awareness and educating people, it's an excellent platform. Plus we're filled with people who are full of love and care. I mean, we're compassionate, we're empathetic. I mean, we talk about what our community was established on, these values of plur, of peace, love, unity, respect, um, of the sense of freedom and acceptance, and you can be anybody that you want to be. You know, back when house music started in, in the warehouses, you know, that was the place you could come when you felt disenfranchised maybe from or discriminated against you're always welcome on the dance floor that's how I fell in love with dance music back in San Francisco I couldn't believe it it was a dead show in a, in a club like this is just amazing so those you know values were there and so um, it's the perfect place to raise awareness and there of course that sense of justice and fairness is throughout you know are those same core values that run through our community so for one it is a great platform Two, mass incarceration is a a gigantic problem in this country and it's everyone's responsibility to wake up and do something about it because I'm connected with the dance music community I felt compelled that it was this is our way of filling this niche of responding to this this need of this great injustice happening by tapping the dance music community and educating people so that's all around awareness then we have because of the music of course is this great connector of people we have a couple different programs so we do DJ workshops for youth we bring in DJs and volunteers and music lovers to connect with youth through music uh, we work with community partners such as Homeboy Industries, Arts for Incarcerated Youth, a place called Home, Boys and Girls Clubs, Girls Rock Detroit. In Detroit, we have a partner there. And so we connect our community directly with youth who live in areas where there's high incarceration rates, over-policing. Um, so many kids have maybe have a parent or a family member, another family member that has been through the justice system. Um, we, As I said, we work with kids in juvenile hall um, so, of course, you know, music, when you bring music to those kids, I mean, they light up, you know, and they're so often being told what they're doing wrong. And here you're giving something them that something's very liberating and that they may have a talent to do and you can tell them about that talent. So that's one of the programs that we do. The other one that we're developing, it's still in development, is our mentoring program. So when youth are leaving the juvenile justice system, we want to pair them with mentors from our community to perhaps pursue a career in music. Now they might just think a career in music is, is they only think it's a DJ or a rapper or they're not seeing that there's all these careers and from producing events to everything in between, you know? And so to get them on a creative career path and this may just be the intro part. They might find that they're turned on by something else. Um, but music is, again, that connector. Who are some of the artists that you've worked with in the past? Well, we just had Reagan from Dance Spirit come into a place called Home, which was wonderful. Um, ben and on sitting right next to me is the epitome of someone who uses music to give back and make a difference. Stacy Hot Wax Hale, uh, the godmother of house out in Detroit. She heads up and leads the workshop at Girls Rock Detroit over there. Uh, Arabian Prince, um, one of the founding, founding members of NWA, he started Electro. He's been coming in with the sub pack. And right now, DJ Missy B, who, I think she just played EDC. Oh, really? But, um, okay. Or one of the after parties. I think she was on an art car. And she's an amazing addition to our team. She heads up our workshop program and teaches. She's phenomenal. So, yeah. 
And Ben, how long have you been involved with Give a Beat? Um, I've been involved with Give a Beat since since the beginning, and was involved with Lauren's prior project, Next Aid, before that. I love what Lauren does with Give a Beat, and I feel like she is like kind of the active part of really connecting with the community and and running the programs. And I just know my role is my passion is to produce events and and to play music. So I know that's my focus. So my role is I see more as in fundraising, really, and also. Raising awareness and so that's something I've taken on a little more recently is trying to educate a little bit on how you can give back to the community and how it's maybe not as hard as you think and maybe it could be just a little change in what you're doing and that's the way to start. My biggest event is this Tropical Boat Party which is a benefit for Give a Beat that's coming up in a couple weeks Uh, so that's definitely where my focus is a lot these days. Who are some of the artists that are going to be playing on the boat party? So the boat party has a pretty stacked lineup this year with DJ3 coming out from New York, uh, as well as locals Doc Martin and Marcus Wyatt, who are obviously headliners on their own right, and Patricio, Jamie Schwabel, and myself. So this LA event, your Tropical Boat Party, is kind of like the anchor event, but there's also events going on across the country. Is that right, Lauren? Yeah, um, this is a model that we started when I was doing Next Aid, where we picked one day out of the year it was just a rallying point for all these different partners to come together. We used to do something every year around World AIDS Day. The similar model, um, really, promoters in different cities do what they do best, make and promote their events. And so this year we have 10 events happening across the country. Very excited to have uh, New Orleans on the map this year because the state of Louisiana incarcerates more people per capita than any other country in the world. So. We have this massive problem of people going to prison and getting plea deals. They never see a day in court. They can't make bail, so they're sitting there. In Louisiana, each state pays for their public defenders a different way. In the state of Louisiana, they pay for it with traffic tickets. So around the time of Katrina, when there was nobody driving and there was no traffic tickets being given out, no fun for public defenders. So this whole baloney of, you know, all these rights you get, it's it's a crock. This is why our community, we need to wake up. Our brothers and our sisters and their children are suffering from this. The, here's the positive side though. It's not that hard. Every single one of us can do something and it can make a massive difference. We can hire people who have felonies on their record. We can be mentors for them. We can just be their friend. We can welcome them home. You can write to people who are incarcerated who got put away and and time has passed and they've been moved, separated from their families and they live too far away for their families to go visit them because they do that, you know, they trade prisoners. Um, You can be there, you can can volunteer in an after-school program and be there for a youth that hasn't gone down that path yet. Do you feel hopeful at all or optimistic about the future? Things changing, laws changing? How is this going to get better? Yeah, optimism is a funny thing. I think like say, it's really easy to, to look at the political climate, especially right now, and, and be very pessimistic about it. But pessimism doesn't produce results except for wallowing in misery. So we have to stay optimistic. It is hard to be optimistic with the state of things right now. But we can rebel <laughs> against the direction of things by saying we're not going to let this get us down. One way we can do that is by getting involved and being there for people and addressing this issue. You know, as I said previously, this is something that each and every single one of us can make a difference, even if it's just in one person's life. Well, thank you very much for coming down today and sharing your story and and doing what you guys do. It it is a huge problem here in the United States and and one that I feel the dance music community can definitely help get involved and make a difference. Thanks so much for having us, Rob. Thank you. If people want to know more about this, there's that um, documentary on Netflix called 13th, which every single person in this country should watch. It's incredible. And it, and it backs up everything that she uh, that she talks about in your interview. I encourage all of you guys to go check out giveabeat.org and see where, how you could get involved and what you could do to make a change. You know, we have such an active community in dance music. Uh, if you have other things that you're passionate about, other causes, not just this one, but it's really important for a community as active and as socially conscious as ours to get involved in something, something that you're passionate about, whether it's this, whether it's discrimination, whether it's, you know, clean water in third world countries. 
um, do your part to, to try and make an impact on the world because it'll be a better place because of all of us. So that was a stack show. Super fun. I hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah, if you want to link up with us, find us on Twitter and Facebook at insomniac.com. Use the hashtag wide awake stories and uh, stay super woke and call us on the wide awake hotline at 310-818-9406. It's hard to believe that we're coming up on one year's worth of episodes. It's been fun, man. Well, I've happy enjoyed birthday this. to us. Yeah. If you want to listen to all our past episodes, head over to insomniac.com. Follow us on Mixcloud, YouTube, at, an, at Insomniac Events. You can find us on iTunes and maybe SoundCloud. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> and since I shared my dream with you guys, if you're calling the Wide Awake Hotline and you have a crazy dream to share with us, share it. Yes. We want to know your dreams. <laughs> See y'all next month. <laughs>